and uh, the individual's chart I have in front of me is Christopher Peralta. Um, you ready, Chris? Not, not really, but go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, it's actually not a bad chart. Uh, there's oh, some very thank you. Stuff in it. I know. <laughs> you can feel good about yourself. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, your sun is in Virgo. Your Venus is in Virgo, and it's conjunct your sun, meaning it's kind of merged with your sun. I'll explain that. And Pluto is conjunct your Venus, also merged. Now, you also have Mercury in, in, in Virgo, which is uh, not conjunct. It's at three degrees, and your sun's at 20, Venus 25, Pluto at 29. So Virgos in general, um, it's Virgo the Virgin doesn't refer to inexperience. Uh, Virgo the Virgin is about purity. And every Virgo is about um, fixing things and perfecting things and making them whole again. Um, on one level, uh, you have to identify the problem before you can fix it. And sometimes a lot of people complain that Virgos can be nitpicking judgmental people. But that's the first half of what they do. Okay. The whole point of finding the problems is that deep down inside, Virgo wants to fix them. Um, sometimes they come off like nags because uh, they're pushing to get it fixed. But it's actually coming from kind of a deeply spiritual place where you're, Virgo is supposed to kind of be one of the healers of the world, um, you know, which is why symbolically, you know, uh, Pisces is opposite Virgo. There's, the, there's kind of signs in opposition kind of balance each other out. So Pisces is sort of the emotional, all-encompassing sign. Well, Virgo is the one that takes care of all the details. Pisces says everything is one. And Virgo says, yeah, but it's made up of a million pieces. Okay. <laughs> Um, so there's this kind of nitpicking, fussy, it has to be done right, damn it, kind of quality. Now, your sun is conjunct Venus. Venus is how we schmooze, how we connect. It's the planet of beauty. When the sun is conjunct Venus, you are naturally an attractive person, okay? People are drawn to you. They feel comfortable around you on some level. I'm not saying you're Clark Gable or you're incredibly good looking. You're attractive. People are drawn to you for some reason. And you're also, when... Now, Virgo is already somewhat refined because they, they nitpick and they want to they want to do everything right. Venus gives you a certain amount of charm um, and quality to be able to, to talk smoothly to people and connect with them in a pleasant way, even when you're judging them. Okay, somehow you make them feel like, like you know, I kind of see what you're saying, Chris. Yeah, you know, and, and maybe later on they'll go, that little bastard. But, you know, right up front when they're talking to you, and, and you have a very strong arm. Um, when Pluto, which is the planet of domination on some level, is conjunct Venus, you can you can be, and not necessarily in an evil way, a very dominating presence. You have a very strong kind of charisma or energy about them. When Pluto is conjunct Venus or very strong in a chart, um, you're compelling. And and people don't even always know why, but they're like, I'm, I'm interested in what he's talking about. Combine that with the Venus conjunct your sun, which is kind of smoothing it out and making it more pleasant. Um, you might be, and I mean this in a positive way, kind of a, a an iron fist in a velvet glove. You know, you can be very strong arm, but it's not, um, you're not actually punching people out. You know, you're kind of like, well, you don't understand this over here is what's the best thing for you. You know, and you're kind of coaxing them because you are trying to heal them, even though, you have to, one of the things I always warn all Virgos about, don't try to heal people that don't want to be healed. Okay. Yeah. That ain't going to work. Understood. Um, okay. But it's a natural thing um, to, uh, to Virgos to want to uh, always improve things and make things more qualified and, and make things better. Um, and the Pluto makes it very important. And on some level, uh, how do I put this? You transform yourself when you're helping other people. Um, when you're trying to help other people grow and change, it's actually, you're not just, you know, a pain in the ass nitpicker. Uh, it's actually something that spiritually enriches you. Okay. Um, you get a lot of personal growth and excitement out of like helping somebody heal uh, on whatever level that means, whether you're helping them with their bookkeeping or helping them fix their car, whatever it might be, you enjoy helping others fix things in their lives. And it gives you a lot. Now you're weird about it. Okay. Um, Uranus, the planet of weirdness, is uh, all the way at the bottom of your charts. And that means it's all the way in the core of who you are. There's a part of you that just likes being weird. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. Uh, as a matter of fact, you have something we call a grand, grand trine in your chart. 
what that means is a trine, as I mentioned, is a harmonious connection between two planets. Well, you have one planet trine in another, trine in another, and then back to the original planet. If we drew that on a chart, we'd have a big triangle in your chart. This is really kind of a wonderful gift of harmony. And your planets that are combined together are Saturn, the planet of control, is working very harmoniously with your Mars, the planet of action, which is working very harmoniously with Uranus, the planet of I've got to be weird. Okay. <laughs> so uh, what that means, it, it works out well, though. Again, I, I, some of what I'm saying might sound a little negative, but you actually no, have, not at all. have, okay, you've finessed this very well. Uh, Saturn, when it trines or works harmoniously with Mars, means it keeps Mars from charging ahead and doing whatever it wants to do. But Mars keeps Saturn from just sitting there going like, let's keep everything the way it is. So it's kind of controlled action, like a focused action. And that's kind of wonderful. And they both try on Uranus, which just amplifies your Mars, which is already in Aquarius and likes to do things in a different way. So you're really kind of a person. When Uranus trines Saturn, you're the kind of person that can bring new ideas into the physical world. You're kind of an originator, originator person because you'll dream up things that haven't been done before and you're capable with all that Virgo practicality and Saturn kind of helping you focus it, you're able to bring them into the physical world and make them function. In a way of speaking, you're kind of an inventor, but I don't want to make that literally like, you know, you're, you're making the next, you know, uh, the next uh, tomato chopper or something or, or, you know, vacuum cleaner, but there's an inventiveness about you. You're constantly looking at things in a different way, but you're very analytical about it. Well, that Virgo, that Virgo energy is always saying, does it work? Is it real? You know, Mercury and Virgo, Mer you're, how we think. Mercury loves being in Virgo. It's one of the rulers of, of Virgo. So you you think very analytically and very carefully. The biggest risk of Mercury and Virgo is you may think too much. Yep. Uh, yeah. So you may want to practice meditation because it involves like not trying to think. I mean, thoughts come into your mind anyway when you meditate, but, you know, it's let go of them. Don't Don't think them through. Because uh, you do have a, f a fairly decent intuitive streak. It's a little challenged, but it's there. So uh, you can trust not thinking is what I'm saying. Although there's a part of you that's like, why would I do that? You know, <laughs> so, um, you have you know, regarding intuition, Jupiter, the planet of expansion and growth and new ideas and, and kind of usually considered a, it's called the great benefic planet, um, is conjunct or working intimately with your Neptune. It's so conjunct that Jupiter is at zero degrees, 22 minutes, and Neptune is at zero degrees, 36 minutes. They're right on top of each other. Neptune is a profoundly creative planet. Uh, when it's functioning well, it's really about spirituality, intuition, a certain amount of psychic streak, incredibly creative. When it's not functioning too well, it can be about sort of self-delusions and, and fantasies. And sometimes if it goes really dark, it can be about... Um, problems with drugs uh, i'm not saying drugs themselves are the problems but using using drugs to escape or drinking that, like escapism can be the dark side of neptune i think you're a little too grounded to to move in that direction but as a result you've really kind of got this rich um creative well to draw on that is not logical and as i'm sure you've realized in this life your ideas have just sort of popped into your head. And then, of course, the Virgo jumps on them and says, says can it work? Let's see. You know, let's try it out. Let's race it around the, the, in, you know, the city and see what goes on. Um, and uh, your Mercury, by the way, is in your house of finances. You probably work in some way connected with communication. Uh, Mercury, <laughs> Mercury in the second house. It could be computers. It could be uh, communication. You could write. You could be a comedian, apparently. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure who's laughing. That's but, Mark uh, in the background uh, with his microphone turned off. My mic is off. Because okay. he's an That's asshole. I can't. Well, I'm tell, sure tell being an asshole. Is I, I'm a senior telecom, telecommunications engineer. Bingo. And I have been for 24 uh, years. So the Uran Shut the up, Mark. Uran By the way, Uranus, which I said is well put together in your chart, is also about high technology. So... Uh, the fact that you come up with new ideas, you're probably working things. It's all it's all part of your gifts. So you know it makes perfect sense. Now, uh, your Mars is in Aquarius, which, as I mentioned, likes to do things in a different way. It's also in your house of relationships, close relationships. Now, when I say one-to-one -one relationships, it can be lovers and spouses. It can be close personal friends. It can also be business partners. Um, so it's usually about 
closer one-to-one relations. Well, Mars is in there, which means uh, you like very active relationships. Uh, sometimes you end up liking combative relationships. Um, you you probably butt heads a bit with your friends, not in a mean-spirited way, but you're not the kind of guy that likes to probably sit around and watch movies with your friends. You've got to be doing something. There's got to be interaction. Something's got to be going on. Just sitting around and being passive with your friends is just not of interest to you. Sometimes it does imply you can be a little quarrelsome, uh, and 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 sometimes you you might even be the kind of person that just takes the other side because you take the other side because you just like to stir things up. Um, and uh, your moon, however, is in Cancer at 22 degrees, and it's just above your rising sign, which means it's conjunct your your rising sign. Your rising sign is in Cancer. Very late. It's about 28 degrees, 42 minutes. Now your birth time. It sounds pretty exact, although I do find generally nurses tend to write these things. Nurses aren't astrologers, so they're not there sitting there like, what would the astrologer want on the chart? So sometimes they'll just look up at the clock when they fill out the birth certificate. So you might be born a little bit earlier, a pinch, like a, maybe 5 or 10, 15 minutes. So you're definitely cancer with the moon right up front. Now, as much as you're a Virgo and a nitpicking little son of a bitch, um, <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> the the cancer rising makes you very much a nurturing person um cancer wants to nurture so this kind of on one level on an emotional level ties in with your virgo that wants to heal and help people so there's this constant notion in your chart and and i mean this in a higher way of speaking service to other people is very important to you you and I don't, i'm not talking about you know a butler or something but how you help other people you really enjoy helping other people nurturing them getting better you might do it a little heavy-handed you know that velvet that velvet glove iron fist kind of a thing you can be kind of compelling and demanding at times um but i think for the most part you're fairly compassionate your moon's in cancer that's about as emotional as you can get so even though you might have this like i'm virgo and i'm practical there's a lot of emotions that drive you of course um, it's yep. may, maybe not clear on the surface but it's just underneath it's like it's like the Cancerian moon is the wave and Virgo surfing it, okay, <laughs> is the kind of the way I would describe how you manifest it. Um, sometimes, and I'm not big on physical attributes based on a chart, but uh, sometimes Cancer rising can have kind of a moon-shaped face. Um, one example, like Linda Ronstadt had a very round face. She happened to be Cancer rising, you know. So sometimes, but not all the time. So I, I take that with a grain of salt. Some of the old-time astrology claiming that, you know, oh, they're skinny or oh, they're fat or oh, they're tall. I, I have a little bit of issues with, but uh, clearly there's an emotional quality right up front and a nurturing quality. And as a result, as I mentioned, cancer can be very sentimental. Um, loyal to your friends is kind of important to you. Um, and you probably, you're, you're so intense with your friendships in that Pluto conjunction that uh, when you make a friend, uh, whether they like it or not, they're your friend for, for life. It's like, they don't, they don't in it after that um once you've connected with them it doesn't mean you're going to rush in and connect with everybody but it does mean that when you do that's it baby um well this is by the way this is mostly done kind of off the cuff um so the grand time's really nice uh you also have saturn trining that's a little wide um saturn is sort of trining the pluto also which is a lot of wonderful qualities of self-control um the uh uranus on your nature does suggest uh a bit of a disruptive child and what I mean by that is it could mean that you moved a lot. It could mean that um, you just came out of a very odd family. And I don't, again, not Bajardo, but they could have all been Bohemians. They could have all been just people that weren't, you know, whatever the word normal means, whatever we define as normal, they weren't that. Um, it can suggest an unusual home, like maybe you just lived in a place, like it wasn't a traditional thing. Maybe you, I don't know, shared a house, lived in a weird building, whatever it might have been, or lived in an unusual home. So there's a certain amount of disruption, you know, in the home and mom connection. Although most Cancer Moons get along pretty well with their mom, doesn't mean they get along great with them. Dad's actually probably, you're tight with both of them. I mean, I wouldn't, as challenging as your childhood might have been in the sense of kind of surprises and, and changes that went on, uh, there seems to be kind of a solid connection to both parental figures. And although although you do kind of have a rebellious streak um, and even sometimes buttered heads with your mom, um, it was more for show. You base, I think you basically got along with your parents. I don't see anything that's uh, like, oh, my God, look at that mother. I don't see that in this chart. Uh, they, you kind of get along with them. Now, there is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, you have a T-square in your chart. Now, what that means is that uh, two planets are opposite each other in the chart. 
And then there's a third planet that if you drew the lines connecting, you draw a big T. So there's Mercury is squaring Saturn and squaring Neptune and Jupiter. So although you communicate well, I think you, and you're very commun you're a very innovative writer in the sense of you can be very poetic and very empathetic in your writing. Um, sometimes it's hard for you to, to finish it, to get it put together, um, because a lot of the times you're writing about stuff that, or communicating about stuff that hadn't been invented before you thought of it. So in order to explain it, you've got to explain the concept, explain what you've learned about it, then explain, you know, what that means and how you can use it. So there are times you have difficulty communicating because your thinking is so out there uh, in the best possible way, but out there. You know, one of the things about geniuses, and, and I want to clarify when I use the word genius, um, I don't think geniuses are necessarily like have a, like a 300 IQ. What makes a genius different is that they think in a different pattern. So the best example I can give is, you know, everybody going, oh, one plus one equals two. Why, yes, one plus one equals two. Yes, we all agree, one plus one equals two. And then the genius comes along and says, two minus one equals one. And everybody goes, oh, we never realized that. Well, all they did was turn it upside down and look at it backwards. And that's what a genius is constantly doing. And probably what you do a lot is like, oh, I know you said one, two, three, but what about three, two, one? Or what about two and then one and then three? So you're, you're, a, you're a pattern breaker or else you recognize the patterns that other people aren't seeing. And so you kind of turn things upside down a lot of the times, which pisses a lot of people off because they don't like that touch of them. You know, more often than not, the innovators... You know, either they build a cross for them or, um, you know, my favorite example is the uh, the doctor in the mid-1800s who first suggested that uh, maybe we surgeons should wash our hands. And he was like laughed out of the academy and humiliated and surgeons would say, our, our bloody aprons are what, it's a badge of service. And of course he was rejected. And then, you know, 50 years later, it's, it's canon and everybody's doing it. Right. That's the problem of being a genius. You're right, but... 90% of people hate you anyway because you're upsetting the apple cart. And and look, the apple cart needs to be upset. We need these people. But it can be at times a bit rough. Now, you're blessed because you're so good at explaining it. And you're blessed because um, there's things in your chart suggesting you're very good at bringing these new ideas into physical practicality. So it's probably a little less for you because you're the kind of guy that will say, we can harness steam and they all laugh. And then you take out a machine that you made that works with steam. And they go, oh, well, wait a minute. You know, so you, you're actually probably very good at backing it up. But there's, there's always that problem up front. And there is that part of you that likes being a disruptor. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, yes. So mm -hmm. sometimes you almost, you enjoy it too much. <laughs> and you're almost like, well, you can figure it out yourself. But you can't always explain yourself very well. Um, those four planets, uh, Sun, Venus, and Pluto, and Uranus, although it's kind of in your fourth house, are in your third house, which again is the house of communication. So you've got two different, you've got four planets all talking about communication. Um, so as I mentioned, the sun uh, is conjunct Venus. You communicate very well, very articulately. Pluto, you're very compelling in your communications. You're very original and you're very analytical. So other than the fact that sometimes it's hard for you to finally put the period on the sentence and say it's done. And that's a combination of that T-square, which gets a little wobbly when you're trying to, and it's also a combination of, of the, the Virgos always going, wait, there's one more thing I can add. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. One of the things I always tell Virgos and one with four planets in Virgo, I always mention is uh, perfection is insane. Perfection is a static state where nothing changes. Don't try to be perfect. Use most Virgos should learn to use the mantra. That's good enough for now. Okay. And if you don't like it, say next time we'll improve it. Yeah. Because otherwise you'll be dicking around for the next seven days and never finish anything because, yeah. you know, yeah. I can make it better. I can make it better. I can, yeah. But it works now. Just yeah. get your damn hands off of it. Yeah. I just, it. just get it over with and shut the hell up. Yeah. You know, and like I say, the motivation is, is coming from kind of a, a loving place. You, you, you want to perfect this. You can right. make this better. You know you can, but um, other people don't give a shit. Okay, they want to get the thing as it's working and let's do it now. So you'll you'll need to, that will help you a lot in your life if you find the balance um, 
uh, you know, this is when the Libra is supposed to start laughing. When you find the balance, um, he's on he's on mute, by the way. Oh, okay, um, between uh, the nitpicking and the the practicality of it, and what actually you know can be done. You know, I often joke a lot of Virgos are working after everybody's gone home um, because they, they it's not quite <laughs> done yet. You know, um, you're lucky your Mars isn't in Virgo because people with Mars go never go home; they're just at the office all the time. Um, or the lab or whatever they're working at. The problem um, is I'm more efficient and I'm more effective than everybody else, but and I still work longer hours. That's well, fucking yeah. horrible. Well, you've got to learn to play. Oh, yeah. And then I just at 5 o'clock, I'm like, okay, fuck this. I'm going to go. Yeah, you've got to d declare that boundary yes. and just say, you know, let go of this. And know it'll be there when you get back. It's, it yeah, be done it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, that's natural. You have a, va a very natural creative ability that Neptune and Jupiter, I mentioned, is in your fifth house of creativity. So uh, you're a very creative person. It's a natural thing for you to express yourself. Um, now, even though you're very late Cancer rising, there's a lot of Leo in your first house. So you do have a good, healthy ego. Um, Leo can often go dark and become egomaniac. But I think the Virgo keeps you in check. Um Regarding actually relationships in general, besides that combative nature I said that you had with uh, Mars in the seventh house, your Venus is in Virgo. And the funny thing about Venus in Virgo is uh, it's a little tough to be um, schmoozing and connecting to people when the Virgo is sitting there judging the partner all the time. Uh, my, uh, my wife has Venus in Virgo, and she, she's acknowledged to me that, um, <clears throat> and other people with Venus in Virgo said, every day... They are assessing their partner. Every day is a new day to a Virgo in a relationship. They're always, ideally not judging. You know, I always prefer the word assess to judge because judge means, you know, judged, convicted, execute them. Whereas assessing just means like, well, this is good and maybe this, these changes. So Venus and Virgo is always assessing their partners and constantly wanting to, to improve. Again, a loving quality. And again, if the person's not ready to improve, really annoying. Uh, so I'm not I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but um, it's important, and you have a good sense of empathy. It's important to recognize when somebody is not ready. You know, you're trying to keep your friend, get your friend to stop drinking because they're an alcoholic. They may not be ready to hear that yet. They may, may need to have a car accident and spend uh, six months in traction before they're willing to hear that, or they may need to have you know they lose their job and their fortunes or whatever. So you really have to tune in to when somebody says help me and means it and when somebody says help me i want you to do this for me because i don't want to deal with it um and that's the curse of any healer uh learning to recognize when something needs healing and when somebody really just wants to be enabled you know um, so that's one of the challenges and actually to use uh there's something in astrology uh called the north node which sort of symbolizes if you believe it uh, the direction in life that we grow the most and learn the most What's interesting is yours is in the house of one-to-one -one relationships. You're cool. You know who you are. You know what you do. Other people are your biggest bane, okay? <laughs> because uh, as much as you're a healer and, and want to help people, there's part of you that just doesn't get them, you know? No, and there's the more... not a part of me. There's all of me. <laughs> and yet you manage, you love helping people. And it you is love... so dumb. <laughs> That's completely illogical. <laughs> And that's the Virgo logic going, this doesn't add up. No, it doesn't add up. People people are not mathematical equations. I should have been drinking during this, Anthony. <laughs> well, you can always listen to it again when you're drunk. Oh, uh, that's going to happen tonight. That's you know. what beer Google is for, my friend. Don't worry, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, so go the, ahead. The, the other thing I just want to mention, um, you know, with your late cancer rising, um, Saturn right now by transit, where it is in the sky, has moved into your seventh house. Uh, you may find the next year or two um, a, a bit of a struggle with friends and partners because uh, Saturn, whenever it transits something, really kind of asks you to assess it, throw out the dead weight, and and be very focused. Find at a time when, if there are one-to-one -one relationships that aren't working, you will be ending them. Okay, it's already started. One, yeah. Okay. Um, and it's it's going to be for like a couple of years. So the Saturn Great. takes about. Super excited it. about that. Uh, I'm sure. Just Does my small. chart say everyone... that I'm incredibly sarcastic? <laughs> well, so. yeah, of course it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, that Mercury, you see, the thing is, whenever somebody becomes too logical, like Mercury in Virgo, um, 
yeah, there's a part, the only way you can cope with things not being logical is to get snotty. Um, <laughs> and I understand that. I can, I have quite a time myself when people piss me off. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's a normal thing because you, you keep trying to make the world logical. And there's, remember, we have two halves to our brain. Is the logical half the right, and then there's the right half, which just does whatever the hell it wants to do, <laughs> and does is, is like a fog on one side, and the logical half is always trying to take the ideas from the fuzzy half and make sense out of them. Now you happen to be well built in your chart to make sense out of insanity, in the sense that you come up with crazy ideas and you go, oh, but I know what I can do with this, and you can make it practical. But we can't do that with people. They're going to just do whatever the goddamn hell they want. You can't just take a wrench and adjust a few nuts and they're going to behave themselves. And that's why maybe your issue this time around in life is to the more you understand people, the more you will evolve and grow and expand. Because that's that's the part, Murray mentioned, there's always those parts in your chart where you have something to learn. Um, the more you learn and understand other people, the more more connected and balanced you'll become and the less annoyed and pissed off you'll be all the time, <laughs> you know, because I know you are, you know, because uh, people are not perfect and uh, and, you know, they could be. And that just bugs the hell out of you. Um, so that's but, but I want to point out when Saturn goes into that there, actually, Jupiter is going to follow it next year also. And Jupiter alleviates it a bit. It's Jupiter and Saturn are kind of like opposites. Saturn says like focus and get rid of all the crap. And Jupiter says, try something new and be more beneficial. So the two of them might work pretty well as it goes through your seventh house where like you'll cut people out, but maybe you might even feel a little more generous towards people and understand you st might still cut them out, but it won't be from, I hate you. Let me get you out of your life. And more like, you know, I understand you, but I still don't want you in my life, you know, which is a whole different way of going about it. Yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, you're actually, where the heck is Neptune now? Neptune's at 20 degrees right opposite your sun. You're actually entering into a period of a few years where uh, spiritual and mystical become more important to you. Uh, we're talking about a three or four year period. So it's an undercurrent. It's not like a constant thing. Uh, the idea that you just started these a couple of a short while ago with, with Mark doing these podcasts is to me an example of how you're opening up and be trying to try on new ideas and new concepts. So you can look over the next two or three years from by transit is sort of challenging you to open up a bit more, be maybe a little less logical, uh, be maybe a little more intuitive because you got the intuitive streak and you've always used it in service to logic. And now I think you're kind of going to be getting asked over the next few years, but what it, can intuition stand by itself? Does it have to have a logical basis? You know, these are the questions you'll probably be coming up with and come up with your own answers, you know, and you may find things because when planets are in opposition by transit, it usually means the outside world brings in the things that you need to address. So you may find incidents or things in the outside world kind of bringing you these questions of like, you know, what's real? What isn't real? Is intuition valid? Is Am I being too logical? These are just things that's kind of an undercurrent. You know, it's not like you're going to be tortured of what is real and what isn't real, but it's almost sort of uh, amending and, and kind of blending and, and asking you some questions about like, well, we know, you know, the hard and fast rules. What about the unwritten rules? What about the invisible rules? You know, what about the rules that are just guidelines that don't that can be bent? Maybe all ways you examine things and bring bring a certain richness to your understanding that's that's very well put together, but maybe a bit uh, how do I put this? Maybe sometimes your your mental system is a little too closed. Okay. It's a great system, okay, and it really functions really well. But uh there may be a door or two you could open that would enrich it even more, is what I'm saying. And that's maybe what Neptune might be asking over the next two or three years. While you're throwing people out of your life. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, those things seem like they cut together. Well, because you might end up bringing in people that, new people that will bring you ideas that make sense to you as opposed to the ones you're throwing out are okay. the ones. Saturn never throws out what you need. Okay, so when you are ditching people, it's because they're not functioning in your life anymore. Or they're not bringing you something. But Neptune could bring in people with new ideas that you're sort of like, I never thought of it that way. Wait a second. And, and sort of make you question things like on one level. And this is the way astrology works. I could be, I'm working for Neptune right now in your chart. I could, I could look, if I was standing outside this and looking at you and me, I'd be like, Oh, you know, Chris is checking with an astrologer because Neptune is opposite his chart, his son. So he's looking to an outside source. That's going to talk to him about mystical, non-logical stuff. Well, here I am on your show. 
talking to you about this. It wasn't Mark that had his chart and said, hey, come look at my chart. It was you. So that's Neptune opposite your sun going, hey, come on. And actually, your sun's at 20 degrees, 55 minutes. Today, Neptune is at 20 degrees, 53 minutes. It's sitting right on your ass across the other side of the chart. And here I am. So that's <laughs> that's a way. I don't know if that chart made a lot of sense or not. Some of it, Obviously, Mark found it hysterically funny. Uh, <laughs> But uh, that's basically your chart. I mean, you're welcome to ask anything else, but this is sort of like, you know, a, a quick 15, 20 minute wrap up. I mean, I can usually when I do a reading, I, I do it for like an hour, hour and a half and, and get a lot more into detail. But I wanted to just point out those things. I don't know how well it gels with your computer generated report. But, um, uh, I, I have a couple questions and then I can go through the things that I highlighted. Sure. Um, my first question is, what does the chart say about my sense of humor? Well, you know, um, this is part of that T-square. Uh, Mercury is how we think. Um, squaring Neptune gives you a lot of imagination, but it's a square which sometimes misfire. So uh, coming up with smart-ass remarks um, out of the blue that may be sometimes a little harsh, um, Saturn is squaring your Mercury, so it, they're usually – your sarcasm is kind of judgment-based – because Saturn likes to judge and assess things. And they're both kind of, both the mystical planet and the creative planet and the practical planet are kind of struggling with your way of expressing yourself. And, and you want to express yourself as a logical Virgo. But as you said earlier, you just can't take people. Okay. So that little whip comes out and uh, you could look at it as dark humor, but I don't call it deep dark humor. It's more just, you know, screw the world. You're all a bunch of idiots. You know, I'm going to tell you how I feel. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, what did, what did, go ahead. What else do you want to ask? Or if you, what did the chart say? Though? The chart doesn't say it doesn't really. It says I have a good sense of humor like six or seven times in different ways. Yeah, because the Venus conjunct the sun will make you get along with people and relax and be kind of easygoing, even if you are Virgo. Uh, you know, and you're very original and that turns up a lot too. And so humor comes from originality. You know, dad jokes are not funny. No shit. Humor is. So you're not a dad joke generally. No, not at all. And I've always wondered, my parents aren't funny at all. My, my uh, mother was not at all. My dad told jokes that he memorized, and mm. they were fucking horrible. <laughs> fucking horrible. Why do bees hum? Because they don't know the words. Dad, Ooh. shut yeah, the okay. fuck up. Okay. Just, dude, yeah. just shut up. So, <laughs> it's yeah, an intermittent therapy session as well. Yeah, but sorry, thank you, doctor <laughs> therapist. So, uh, <laughs> so I I've always wondered because I and this is very egotistical of me to say I'm one of the funniest people that I know. The things that well, I think in my head make me laugh out loud because this shit's funny. Because you're very creative and very original. Um, you're a lot more original than your parents. Absolutely. You know? I, mean, I mean, imagine if, you know, uh, I don't know, name a comedian was raised by two accountants. <laughs> and, um, it's going to be a problem because, like, you're making jokes and they're going, well, that doesn't add up, you know. Um, so it's a whole different mindset. So like I say, you got along with your parents, but it, there's definitely disconnects there, you know. They, I really they didn't get along with my parents. Well, were they monsters or did you just sort of put up with them? Uh, my father was a Mexican Catholic army drill instructor. So I lived in fear until I was 17. Oh, he so ruled, uh, I would like to use your line, Anthony, about an iron fist. He ruled with an iron fist. And but it was, no velvet glove. None. It was, a, <laughs> it was a, a line of fear and respect. And that's the Mexican way. So my ah. mother was this docile white woman and my dad was just boom. And you don't get out of line or you suffer the wrath. And that's the way it was. Okay, pal, here's what's going on. Your Saturn, which represents dad and represents, as I mentioned, authority and control, is opposite or fighting with your incredible creative side, that Neptune and Jupiter in your house of creativity. So dad's rules were suppressing the shit out of you. Well, of course. Okay. Um, and... Um, to this day, it may even be one of the reasons you struggle with the spiritual and the non-logical. Because look, all of us deep down inside, whether we're 40 or 70 or 90, 
still want mommy and daddy to like us. Of course. And um, you may have to at some point get to the part where it's like, well, dad, you did an okay job, but, you know, go to hell. I have my own beliefs. And uh, it's something we all struggle with. I don't want to make it sound like it's unique to your chart. But in your case, dad was definitely suppressive. And in a certain way of speaking, when I'm looking at the chart, I completely being able to explain it. uh, Getting past your father will help you move into the future. Um, Saturn is in your house of future. and, And wherever Saturn turns up in the chart, it shows an area where we need to learn a little bit. So on a certain level, Saturn is kind of saying to you poetically, until you get past whatever's blocking you here, you're not going to quite get to the future, whatever that means. And I'm using that term very loosely. Um, So the patterns in Saturn also represents the emotional baggage we carry with us. So it's suggested, this is what I'm saying. I did a quick reading, but now we're getting to the depths of a reading. The more you can uh, cope with what your dad did, take it apart, throw out what you didn't need, keep what made sense, um, the more you'll still tend to hold yourself back. And I actually suspect now even more so that Neptune opposition where I said the weirdness will come in to sort of try to break up your logical log jams could be one of the things that helps you move into the future and deal with the, the baggage that you still carry from your dad. Now, some of the stuff he taught you, I'm sure was legit. Absolutely. On one level, Self-control, discipline are very important things. Of course. But if self-control is based on your piece of shit and you have to do this, well, that's that's not even about self-control anymore. You know, it's really more about abusing yourself and thinking you're worthless. And uh, that's just simply not true. But sometimes our parents have their own problems. So that might even be part of this Neptune opposition is that you may even resist it because there's some voice inside you going, Daddy won't like me if I do this. And... Uh, there's another voice that should also be saying that sarcastic voice. Well, the hell with that. You know, um, I am who I am. Use that Leo up front to sort of like be a little more egotistical. Nothing wrong with being egotistical. The problem is when we become egomaniacs, you know, it has, it's good to have a nice health, healthy, thin, it's good to be able to speak English. Hold on a second. It's good to have a nice, healthy sense of self and worth. Of course. Like, you know, I count, I matter. Um, and so, and you do have that to a degree. You, you think you got the best sense of humor. There's a certain pride you have in what you do. Um, but there's a lot of discipline that's, you still have the invisible armor on you that your dad built for you. Yep. And it's time to like shed some of that armor and look, it'll be scary because at some point you're like, but I've been wearing this for the last 40 years. It's like, how can I take this off? And, but you'll discover, you'll get used to it and you'll probably be, for a Virgo, a lot looser and more casual. Um, you know, you're never going to lose that logic and that self-discipline. It's kind of built into your chart, but you want to balance that out with the uh, the more uh, frivolous side. You know, there's this humor that doesn't necessarily have to be a, a vicious attack on other people. <laughs> um, and I, you're capable of it. You, you've got a lot of originality, and it's, it's almost like... Um, you're channeling all of your originality into like two or three streams and you can be a waterfall. Okay. It's a great analogy. Um, so, so that's kind of what I'm saying is, is, you know, dealing with your dad, uh, it doesn't even have to be him. Literally. It's really about your inner relationship with your dad, not literally going to him. And although maybe that might be again, if he's around still, that no, might be. What, okay. Have a seance, yell at him. I don't know. Um, but, but that might be, you know, where it really has to work. You got to like un untie the cords that are choking you that he put there and, and, and open up the rest of it. So, um, yeah, I can see that, you know, dad, dad, he, he you gave, he gave you a lot and, and took a lot away at the same time. And you want to restore what he took away. Cause, uh, when we're kids, when we're babies, we know we're worth the entire universe. When we're babies, we get hungry, we cry, and we expect to be taken care of. That's how strong a baby's ego is. Wah, I'm going to be fed. I just go, wah, and I'm going to be fed. And on a spiritual level, that really makes a statement about how we are when we're born. We're kind of perfect when we're born, and we get taught not to be. Um, so you want to kind of understand that there's a part of you that knows who you are, and, and that baby inside you, little baby Chris, you know, um, does know what's, what's best. I was probably and, born with more hair than I have now. Uh, I, probably, I probably was too. <laughs> my, my last question is um, I've had 
Mark included, and several other people tell me that I'm an empath. And I don't, I hadn't heard that word until two or three years ago. And then I had to find out what it is. And I don't necessarily know if that's true or not, but people keep telling me that. So well, it is in your chart. Um, uh, Neptune. Neptune rules Pisces. Pisces is the most empathetic sign. Neptune is strong in your chart. Um, it, it conjuncts Jupiter, which suggests a certain psychic sensitivity, which is, just, you know, psychics have to be empaths. How else do you tune into somebody else if you can't somebody else, you know, which is a certain empathy. Um, so that's naturally there for you. Um, you also have that moon and cancer right up front. So there's a, an emotional side to you. Um, that's very non-Virgo where you just see the tricky part of being an empath is there's no, what's the word again, logical right. way to be an empath. Right. You have to sit there and just sort of open up. And sometimes speaking as a, a cranky practical Capricorn, you know, empathy is a pain in the ass. You may have to care about other people. Uh, <laughs> okay. So there's a part of you that, that you do naturally connect with them. But again, this is that side that you've been talked out of. Okay. But this is what I say that it's there and with Venus conjunct the sun too, you connect to people. Well, you may not realize how empathic you are, but you wouldn't be attracting people if they didn't feel comfortable around you. Yeah. I can't so get them away from me. Uh, well, I know that's your problem, uh, oh, shit. But, but there's something about you that's, that's kind of so comfortable and safe. They're, they're not afraid of you, which means there's an empathy coming out of you. There's something coming out of you as magnetic and as kind of charismatic as you can be with that intense Pluto kind of energy. It's welcoming. It's not, it's not, I'm going to crush you. It might be, I'm really stronger and I'm stronger than you, but they they feel comfortable around you. People who aren't empathetic are not going to attract those people. Okay. So you have it. Uh, you might find it, you might become more aware of it as you cope with this Neptune transit and this um, uh, uh, dealing with that Saturn stuff with your dad. And uh, actually on some level, that Saturn transit through your seventh house where you get rid of friends, that might even make you realize more how you're actually tuning into other people because you'll be getting rid of the people that you don't, and I don't mean to make it sound cruel. No, people not at all. Resonating. It's so good people, for me though. It's the right thing to do for me to take care of yes. myself. You're, you're going to be getting rid of the people that, that don't bring you anything. Don't bring anything to the table. But the people that drain me, like, have yeah, to go. The, yes. And and that's part of it is recognizing, like I say, that you're the person that wants to help other people. But you've got to recognize who, who helps you and who drains you. You know, I find uh, it took me years to get to this, but as an astrology reader, a couple of nights, couple of weeks ago i did this call-in show and all they did was give me one chart after another to read i did like eight charts in two hours and uh i was just really energized it. these people were genuinely looking for health help and by the end of the two hours i wasn't exhausted i was actually almost charged up and that's because they weren't trying to drain me and that's the trick sometimes of recognizing who wants the help if you're helping somebody that wants to be helped they'll bring the energy to it when you're helping assholes, they suck you dry. Yeah. Okay. And that's the art of, because look, there's that practical ca uh, Virgo in you that says, I can fix everything. It's like, yes, you can, but not everything wants to be fixed. And that's a problem. And you have to recognize the difference. Yeah. I just and, discovered and, that very recently. And that's that, that, again, that Neptune transit is kind of opening up that very creative, empathetic and intuitive side. And look, every scientist Every major logical guy has talked about, you know, what is it? Somebody dreamed up a, uh, somebody understood the nature of circular molecules because they had a dream about a snake grabbing its own tail and rolling down and they woke up and they suddenly realized, oh, the molecule is a circular molecule. So every scientist will tell you intuition has supplied the concepts that they turn into logical things. So intuition and, and non-logical thinking is not your enemy. But it doesn't work logically, so you're suspicious of it because, you know, most marine captains can't turn and say, everybody be psychic right now. You know, it doesn't work that way, you know. So you're excellent at discipline. No oh, shit. But, uh, yeah, but so you don't have to work. You don't have to work on discipline. It's one of those areas where you've, you've got that. So don't worry about, oh, my God, I'm going to, it's going to descend into chaos. You'll never let that happen even right. without trying. Yeah. 
you know, so take a deep breath and like plunge into the deep end of the pool of non-logic. You're not going to drown. You would never let no, yourself No, I'm a drown. deep ender. I'm good at, I'm good at, yeah, yeah, I'm good at that. So, so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about here. You, you're actually at a, at a, 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 a crest or a crux of, of really kind of plunging into the deep end of, of the other side, the right brain and, and the illogical stuff. Look, I just gave you an entire reading based on something that I can't even tell you how it works. <laughs> but clearly it worked, okay? That you know? What was that in the background? He doesn't just shut up, Mark. Two demerits. I just said telecommunications because his title oh. is communications in it. Well, it's, he's good at it, I'm sure. Um, you know, uh, now let's see if you can master, like, psychic communications because <laughs> that's the other side of communications. We're working on uh, that. There's there's a wonderful book in the back, movie. Mark. Uh, yeah. You're so full of demerits, I'm surprised you can talk. Uh, there's a wonderful, the last Robert Altman movie, uh, God, it's set in, it's set in like turn of the century England. And it's about the, it's like a version of upstairs, downstairs, you know, and it deals with the rich people up top and then the maids and workers that live in the building. Uh, I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but at one point there's this wonderful line. One of the servants, uh, they ask one of the servants who's really a well-established, like revered servant, what is it that helps you be best as a servant and she just looked and she said anticipation and what she was kind of saying was that being psychic is makes you the best servant because you kind of sense what the person wants before they ask for it being intuitive and psychic is a fabulous gift when you learn to trust it that's the biggest problem logical people like you and i and i i'm not i i'm intuitive but i at 66 i've broken a lot of the rules because you know they start choking you after a while. Uh, I've learned how sometimes just following my urges has led me to better directions than I would have expected. The biggest trick with intuition is learning to tell your psychic urges from your psychological problems. And what I mean by that is like you come home and you're really depressed and you decide, I want to eat a pint of ice cream. It's like, okay, that's not intuition. Okay, <laughs> that's emotional problems. But if you come home and you decide, you know, I haven't spoken to Joey in about three months. I really have an urge to call him. Call Joey and Joey would be like, hey, I was just thinking of you. And that's psychic. That's not a coincidence. Look, I, the word coincidence, it's about co-incident. It's the same thing Carl Jung talked about with synchronicity. Things happen together for a reason. Not always the reasons we expect. We don't even always know why. That's the frustrating thing about intuition. Why do you have a feeling to do this? I don't know. And then I do it and I discover Oh, that's why. That happens you know, to Mark were, and I every day. And the we more talk about it every that, day. That's that's what Neptune is. That's what that non-logical side is. The side that that Virgo in you looks at and tries to poke with a stick and says, "Go away," you know, because because it's a it's a risky thing because you can't logically do it, and and it requires a le a deep level of trust that's hard for people like Capricorns and Virgos to let go of. You know, I'm, I'm actually, I'm 66 in the past two years. I've become far more intuitive than I've ever been. And it's been a little scary and delightful too, at the same time, by just following that urge that doesn't make sense. Like sometimes the urge is I'm going to punch you in the face. That's too much logic. Don't do that. You know, but if like you're walking down the street and you go, I don't know why I was going to go straight, but I feel like turning down this block instead, turn down the block. Now it might be, you'll discover why. Or it might be there was a car accident you didn't walk into when if you stayed on your path. And you may never know why you followed your intuition. And that's frustrating, particularly for a Virgo or like myself, a Capricorn. But the more you follow it, you know, do you want to get hit by a car and go, oh, that's why I had that urge. <laughs> What's the point of the urge if you don't listen to it? You know? So uh, 100%. Uh, my, my sermonette is over. Okay. <laughs> no, we love it. Love it. Uh, yeah. Um, Chris, you have any more questions or no, anything I, specific? I'm, I'm done. I appreciate it, Anthony. Oh, hey, a lot of fun. For me, fun. I'm sure it was squirmy for you a little no, bit. No, it wasn't nearly as bad as uh, your warning suggested it would be. <laughs> Watch well, me busting chops. See, I have that, <laughs> I, that, hey. that sarcastic humor that I have, too. In New York, <laughs> forget about uh, it. You know, the worst, the worst part about sarcasm is you can't read it in text. It just does no. not work. And, and putting a little winking smiley face doesn't help. No, it never does. Uh, I've yeah. been burned. Yes. 
Well, Anthony, uh, what, what do you have any questions or anything else you'd like to share? This is absolutely your time. I am so well, blessed and grateful that you were came on and did such an in-depth, you know, service. Well, Thank you. You know, it really, I certainly had plenty of time to really kind of lay out the basics of astrology. And that's, I think with people, you know, a lot of people do tests that are, it's hard to scientifically prove astrology. Uh, it's something I'm going to bring up right now. And I no longer try to, I once made the mistake about 15 years ago of actually engaging a group of skeptics. And uh, I realized they had no interest in proving astrology. They just wanted me to do something so they could screw up and, and, and make fun of me, which they did. Um, astrology isn't just science. The problem is, is astrology is also like psychotherapy and interpretive art. So on one level, you have things like the legendary Gawklin tests back in the fifties. And this is before computers could really, uh, Gawklin and Michael, Ms. Mikhail Gawklin and his wife, a couple of French couple, um, did studies of thousands of charts and discovered that the positioning of Mars in everybody's chart had a strong effect on their on their careers. So there is actually some scientific, loose scientific proof for it, but you know, nobody has really attempted anything quite that. And by the way, back then they had to do every chart by hand. There was no software that just automatically generated a chart. So it's an enormous amount of research, the Gawkins, uh, G-A-U-Q, it's some French spelling, I can't even know it. Um, but it is an interpretive side, you know, as, as I demonstrated when my, my, my ex-girlfriend went in and devastated some poor guy with a chart reading. And then I went in and like kind of said, well, there's another way of looking at that. And that's, that's the non-science end that, that, uh, that scientists struggle with because scientists believe the world is completely scientific and it's not. Science is wonderful at explaining science. Uh, I don't think any scientist can tell you who you're going to fall in love with yeah. because love is just one of those like, even as an astrologer, I can I can probably find twelve charts that you connect with really well, but I don't know which one's going to set your spark off. You yeah. know, uh, yeah. I there's say, so like, many factors that go into it. I mean, there's that yeah. biochemistry just between the two, pheromones and everything. And, so many subconscious and, things. And some people can bring up, you know, sometimes it's past lives connecting, and we can't even measure that. You know? I am very it, familiar with that one. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, and honestly, most, you know, you're probably compatible with like 90% of the people on earth. Now, by compatible, I mean, you get along with them. You know, you're not, they're not an enemy or you're not trying to kill them or they're not trying to kill you. But who sets off that spark? Who, look, we don't even know why babies are born when they are. We know what creates them. We know what their bodies are formed like. But even doctors can only give you like a week long range of when the baby might be there. Yeah, you know? it's true. So there's things that science can't explain. And in my universe, that's fine because there are other things that can explain it. Uh, scientists, you know, too many, there's a term, it's called scientism. And, and it's a term referring to the fact that people use science as their new religion. And they don't question it any more than they question, <clears throat> oh, the Catholic church or something like that. You know, I've had so many people tell me, look, we know astrology is bullshit. And I'm like, what research have you done? Everybody knows. <laughs> Like everybody doesn't know that because I've been an astrologer for 34 years. <laughs> right. But they accept science as blindly as they once accepted, you know, don't eat meat on Fridays because God will hate you for it or whatever it might be. So yeah. uh, it's, it's a matter of the thinking process, regardless of what system you're using is yeah. the best way I can put it. And I am, I come from science. Chris and I have m many conversations. And like I said, and I think in Chris as well is the spirituality part. And I use quotes because I don't know a better way to say it is it was thrust upon us. It's not, you know, I, it, it's not something I sought out and it was very interesting. And I do believe science will eventually explain it. I do there. I do think in the quanta or the quantum mechanics kind of aspect might get there if we can test yeah. it prop, prob, you know, probably and possibly. Maybe that'll explain it. Just like when you went back in time and you had a Bic lighter and you lit it yeah. in front of a Neanderthal, they would either worship you or they'd stone you. Okay. And, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing too is that I think, you know, scientists haven't started asking the right questions because sometimes Cause they're expecting take, the answer already. Right. right? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's a funny thing about a year ago, I got on the subway and, um, there was a, I was waiting in the subway stop and this guy asked me if he was on the right way to go to Columbia University. And I said, yes. And I told him how to get there. And, and he volunteered that he was a physicist and he was in town. He worked for, he used to work for 
um, Boeing in Seattle. So he was like really into there as a physicist and, and mechanics and stuff. And he said he was going to a lecture on dark matter. And he was like, you know what dark matter is? And I said, I kind of vague idea. And by the way, I did not volunteer. I was an astrologer at that point. I figured, okay, he's a physicist. I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> and he explained to me, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't know the exact. He said, do you know that maybe only 20% of the known universe is anything we understand? 80% of the universe is dark matter. And we don't even know what that is. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, that's an awful lot we don't know. Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I think it's there. Yeah, yeah, I think it's only five percent that we know, and ninety-five percent is dark matter yeah. and dark energy combined. So we're completely confused right now. Yeah, well, you know, we're just we. It's like you have like five pieces of a puzzle, and it's a thousand-piece puzzle, <laughs> right? And what we're searching, you know, I love that we're searching. That's that's what matters. And I, I think we have gotten to the point where where society has evolved enough to to broaden the search, you know. In, in many ways, a lot of the old religions made sense in the context of um, Jesus always talked about through the father. Well, people understood families back then. That was a structure that they could relate to. Yeah. So he compared spirituality to well, the father. Now, now I might call it the universe or my my higher self or whatever it is, or some people might still call it God. So we're, we're trying to find, I think, new vocabularies and understandings to to assess what these things are, whatever they are, or is my favorite quote about life, let me end with this. Kurt Vonnegut once said, we're here to help each other through whatever this thing is. <laughs> yeah, whatever the hell this thing is, right, I think? Yeah, whatever the hell this thing is, that, that cuts right to the chase. We're here to help each other through whatever this is. End of story. You know? Oh, that's beautiful. It's been a real – I've really enjoyed this. This has been fun. And uh, I hope, Chris, you don't become you know manic depressive after hearing the chart. No, uh, sir. I had no plans to do that. But I appreciate your time and – and your effort. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, and uh, we'll be talking again down the road. Absolutely. It's been a blast for me. Uh, possibly maybe down the road we can do mine, and I can feel how Chris feels right now. <laughs> uh, or um, uh, we also have another podcast. It is called Beer Googles. That's double E, double O, double G. That's when you get drunk and look up random shit on the internet. <laughs> So, okay. so if you ever have a topic that could be m more of a fun topic, you're welcome on the show anytime. You're welcome okay. on Not Conscious. If there's something you want to discuss, we're happy to have you on here. Thank you I again might. for being on here. I'd love you to One finish. Word. Oh, yeah. I'd love to finish with all your information and all you want to share, and then we'll exactly. close it out. Um, if you're looking for me, I'm on Facebook as Anthony Pico, P-I-C-C-O. I also have a web page on Facebook called Just Cosmic Tuesdays, which is about my internet radio show where I interview psychics, astrologers, people that have died and come back, tarot card readers, and every kind of weirdo I can find that's plowing the the the, the woo woo stuff on our on our lives. Uh, I have a very irregular blog uh, called Cosmic Tuesdays on WordPress. So those are all the places you can locate me. Um, and uh, if you want a reading, uh, you can find me. If you just want to learn about astrology, you can find me. Um, I'm pretty open to almost anything. So uh, give me a holler if you want to find out more. Excellent. Anthony, thank you again. We're going to play out some quick music, but uh, we are so grateful that you came on the show. Absolutely. Thank you again. Uh, lots of fun. I thank really enjoyed you. It. Once again, this has been uh, Knocked Conscious. You can go on knockedconscious.com. Uh, Instagram is at knockedconscious. Twitter's at knockedcon. And Facebook is also at knockedconscious. Once again, this is Mark, Chris. We had Anthony S. Pico on today, astrologer, professional astrologer for 34 years. Thank you again, and I hope you guys have a great day.